We think of this event as much as a provocation, as a celebration of the work completed, exactly in your spirit, Tommy. And so we have a tradition of inviting someone we know will inspire us forward, provoke us forward as our keynote speaker each year. This year, we are delighted to welcome Carlton Turner, who will be joining us from Mississippi on this gigantic screen in a moment. Carlton Turner is an artist, agriculturalist, researcher, and co-founder of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, SIP Culture. SIP Culture uses food and story to support rural community, cultural, social, and economic development in his hometown of Utica, Mississippi, where his family has been for eight generations. Just think about that for a moment, that kind of rootedness. You can find Carlton's full and really impressive bio on the back of your program. But I just want to add here that Carlton is a visionary artist, a creator, a leader, and a community builder. And we are tremendously lucky and grateful that he is here with us tonight. So please join me in giving Carlton Turner a warm Richmond welcome. Thank you. What would happen if we planted every seed? How would the world be different if the sidewalks were lined with plants bearing fruit instead of asphalt? How would a classroom that didn't know hunger operate different? How would its brains function? This talk is about seeds and land, the multitude of life that exists inside the tiniest of spaces, the hidden bounty that is held in waiting for the perfect conditions to be cradled in the warmth of the sun-baked soil, to be watered and show patience and given time to grow and show us all that it holds inside. I grew up in Mississippi between two homes. My parents' three bedroom, two bath, built in the late 40s, sitting on 26 acres of good land on a major highway. Well, a major minor highway. You see, we live in a very rural community. It's here that I live with my parents, four sisters and one brother, eight of us in total. We had fields of jubilee watermelons, sweet yellow corn, pink eye purple whole peas and peanuts, sweet potatoes for roasting, and all the things that we love to eat. My mother, Genevia, she's a lifelong teacher. And although she is also an avid grower, her talents were reserved mostly for smaller vegetable gardens. She had done the work of fields at one time, but she also was the first of a family to go to and graduate college. Neither was my father responsible for the row after row after row. Now, Emmett was city by design, born and raised in the black Mecca of the Big Apple, Harlem. He developed a deep appreciation and maybe even a bit of admiration for the rural life, but he never blended into it. Both his voice and gait were foreign and easy to spot. His diction and cosmopolitan ways distinguished him from other Black folks in a community of a lot of Black folks. In this place, where it was not uncommon for a grown Black man to be called boy, my father was always referred to as Mr. Turner. No, the old rust covered Ford tractor and dirt hewn well-worn tools didn't belong to him either. The other home I belonged to was my grandparents on my mother's side, Epsi and Samuel Roberts. Their house was built in 1962, a three bedroom, one bath wood home that housed four generations of relations, children, parents, grandparents, and mud dear and big daddy. 13 warm beds, 13 warm bodies, and all under one roof. The land around this modest home adorned with flocks of chickens, gangs of turkeys, milk cows, and passels of pigs fed them all. Both my homes were different, yet connected through blood and purpose. Either home by itself could live, but together they could both thrive. Grandma worked her entire life, but never held a job. She was a purpose-filled caregiver, tending to elder parents, her husbands and her own, tending to her husband and her 10 children and gaggle of grandchildren, 
but like most mothers of yesterday and today, often forgetting to care for herself. My mother, being her eldest girl, meant that there was a special mother-daughter relationship that I was the beneficiary of. My siblings and I spent a great deal of our weeks at grandma's house. She cooked a minimum of two full meals daily. She had a depth of experience because she became the head cook in her parents' household at the ripe old age of 13. When I met her in 1975, at the tender age of 52, she had already clocked 10,000 hours of kitchen duty several times over. Her culinary talents checked in at expert level. Her artistry with spices and processes produced flavors that painted soundscapes on my young taste buds until she was no longer able to wield a spoon. That was in the late 90s. But by then, my understanding of what constituted good food was definitive. But back to the land and the seas. I call my grandfather a sea talker. He was generally a quiet man, or at least that's how I remember him. It might be that next to my grandmother, who I affectionately and lovingly refer to as the pre-internet, anyone might seem quiet. It may also be that what I remember of a man that I met in his late 60s at a time when he was becoming a more refined version of himself at the, my pre-adolescent ability to recall the totality of a scene were both converging on each other. At any rate, according to the stories I've been privy to since his passing, he was not a big talker. He was a doer. And what he did was take rudimentary tools, a tractor, a hoe, a stick, a shovel, a rake, a bucket, and turn soil and seed into beautiful seasonal bounties. He didn't waste words. In fact, he didn't do waste at all. He had a very discerning eye and was able to find the hidden value in the most unfathomable of places. The animals he raised would benefit from the discarded parts of the produce that he grew. Peanut vines, corn stalks, watermelon rhymes. They all found a life as fresh food for the animals. Never really a need to buy feed. What didn't get discarded was cooked by grandma in the house. The scraps, what little was left after feeding four generations, was dumped in the slop jar to be fed to the hogs. It was a closed ecosystem that all contributed to and all benefited from. Nothing was disposable, nothing discarded, nothing thrown away. If something broke, it would be fixed. If it couldn't be fixed, it could be repurposed into something altogether different and new. Around this time of year, as summer turns to fall, granddaddy would transition from farmer to woodsman. We would often work with him to harvest trees and make them in the firewood to supply his home and the home of elders that were no longer able to do for themselves. He would often take us through the woods to find some lonely tree in some hard but not quite impossible area to reach and throw it. Throwing the tree just means chopping it down but with strategy and precision to make sure it lands where you want it to land. We always wondered why he would walk past so many trees just to get to one particular tree so far away from where we have to load the truck. After my granddaddy passed and I got older, I realized that he was thinning the forest, taking trees that were diseased or dying. You see, he knew what to look for. He knew what to take and what to leave. Today, my grandfather, a man with only a sixth grade education would be called a conservationist and an organic farmer. His skills and the way of life that he lived have come back around to be in vogue. His way of life isn't new. It is informed by indigenous practices that focused on being in relationship with the land. His way of life was an extension of people that didn't have words for trash or worthless, not because they didn't have a sophisticated system of linguistics, but because their practices, the way they lived, had no use for the concept of waste. It wasn't part of their cultural understanding wasn't part of their worldview. My grandfather was an extension of that ancient wisdom that existed on this land 
from sea to shining sea before the practice of just being human was interrupted by Europeans that came onto the shores and refused to see the beauty of the civilization they met, refused to see the human. They only saw the potential for profit through subjugation and genocide and colonization of the people and domination and exploitation of the land and its resources to build their own wealth and power. Well, don't get it wrong now. This too is cultural practice. It is a culture that focuses on the value that can be extracted because separation is the most important tool in their arsenal. You separate the resource from the land, separate the savage from the civilized, separate the native people from their language and culture, outlaw their rituals and spiritual practices. These things were done to eradicate the parts of life they encounter that didn't yield to their own culture of domination. These are the values that were represented by the monuments that were strategically placed around Southern cities and towns and celebrated as heroes. But I don't have to tell you folks in Richmond about that. There's value in re-examining the purpose of statues, but what lies beneath the veneer that needs interrogating? What questions and conversations need to surface as we reclaim our narratives and move our communities into dialogue about our collective history? How can these statues and monuments help us to better understand our complicated past? How will those conversations then help us to work together to forge a way forward? And just to be clear, critical race theory is just another word for history. It's under attack because once you uncover information, then that information must then be considered in the decisions that lay before us. But I'm not here to talk about monuments or critical race theory. I'm here to talk about seeds and the land. You see, there's a generosity that is naturally generated when you find that space in which you can be in conversation with a place, a harmony with the land that can feel peculiar when measured against today's design of instant everything. There's a language in the songs of the morning birds, in the constant carving of the river and its many pathways, in the subtle but evident dance of the flower as it traces the sun across the sky. It's hard to hear though, through all the white noise we generate by our need to just go, 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 instead of just be. And it's almost impossible to decipher if you aren't listening. See, tending to a patch of earth is a humbling experience. The land is always in charge. It has seniority. The land is on a billion year epic journey through time and space traveling at 67,000 miles per second around, miles per hour around our sun. We should all be in awe of just that concept alone. The earth is traveling at an inconceivable speed and still finds the time to observe each season. For most of us, today could be Monday or March or midnight as we push to achieve a success that's been defined by degrees and decimals. But the land doesn't care. To the land, we are just a blink in the eye because where most of us are standing used to be an ocean floor or a mountaintop and will someday be that again and maybe even more. The land is trying to teach us, but we only seek to dominate it. That's the culture we inherited. But all the land wants is for us to listen and listening is the lost art. I live in Utica, Mississippi on the ancestral land of the Choctaw, the Quapaw, the Yazoo, and the Natchez people. My family has been in this community for eight generations, each generation being connected to the land as growers, builders, teachers, preachers. You see, Utica has its own history as a center of production. This once thriving town had three cotton gins, two lumber mills, a railroad station, a textile factory, multiple grocery stores, a butcher shop, doctor's offices, two high schools, and a flourishing retail and social district. But in 2017, my wife Brandy and I began the work of developing the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production. 
and we began by listening. We hosted community conversations, asking a set of simple questions. Look at the map of our community on the wall and show us where you live, where you work, where you shop, and where you worship. The conversations informed us that our community had transitioned over the past 40 years from a thriving rural town to a bedroom community of less than a thousand people. A community that used to produce nearly 85% of its own food now lines up at the Dollar General to shop for food or travel more than 40 miles round trip to the nearest full service grocery store. People often refer to communities like ours as food deserts, but that frame doesn't actually fit the issue. Deserts are thriving, complete and complex ecosystems. What we are experiencing in our community and many like ours is food apartheid, where some communities have access to food while others don't. The defining factor mostly cutting across lines of race and class. Food is the common denominator of humanity. It's the thing that everybody does. It permeates every aspect of our lives. There's not a street you can walk down in any major city or any small town that doesn't have food. There's food everywhere. The relationship we have with our food is a recurring human narrative. I grew up in a community where I had a deep and personal relationship with my food. Many people in my community share that experience. So at SIP Culture, we use stories connected to food as a framework for accessibility for people in our community to enter and contribute their story to an ongoing conversation about our food sovereignty. They may not feel comfortable if the frame is just about the arts, but when you combine food and story, you get a backstage pass to the most prolific of venues for storytelling. The dinner table is the place where I've heard the greatest storytellers of my age. See, coming from a big family, college, cornbread, fried chicken, and candy yams become the centerpiece of a visceral experience adorned by stories that bring layered emotions, tears, and some of the most gut-wrenching belly laughs you will ever experience. In this place, arts and culture bloom and at the same time fade into the performance ritual of everyday life. It's not just table talk. It's both theatrical and emotional. It's personal. It's comedy and drama. It's sometimes tragic, but always educational. My work as an artist is to acknowledge those stories and the legacy and future of our community that is encoded within them. Our ability to achieve health and wellness in our community is directly tied to our agency on the land. It is deeply connected to our ability to construct an analysis of the trajectory our community has taken to this current moment. It is grounded in our ability to tell our own stories about food and our individual and collective histories to this land. And we believe that through the telling of those stories, we can supplement parts of the social fabric that has been lost over the past couple of generations and begin to construct a new community. One that centers the voice of the people that live here and fostering a place that provides health and wellness for all. The central mission of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production other known as SIP culture, is to work to recalibrate the measurements by which economic prosperity are calculated. And in the process, redefine wealth for our rural community. We are taking an intergenerational approach to community, cultural and economic development through the lens of cultural and agricultural production, shifting the community's dominant identity from consumer to producer. We are working to assess, repair and restore the social cohesion cohesion necessary to imagine our community for the 21st century's version of challenges which were put in motion through first contact, colonization, and white supremacy. In this process, Utica becomes the center of energy, embodied in the sense that anywhere you have land, we can grow something. The work began the moment we offered our idea as a seed to our community to nurture and grow in that moment, when we ask permission to share our dreams with the community and have those dreams embraced, the people began to share and place their dreams on top of ours. Together, 
our ideas and aspirations became interlaced. And that process, well, that's the work. That is the seed of collective transformation. Difficult to see the incremental change, like the flower dancing to the rhythm of the sun, but also moving at 67,000 miles per hour through space and time. Have you ever seen a collard or an okra seed? They're a little bit larger in size than a grain of sand or a pebble, but with attention, sunshine, water, and patience, a handful of seeds can mean the difference between life and death for an entire family. Now imagine how the world would be different if we planted every seed. If we created an environment that nurtured life and meditated on abundance, how would our bodies respond if we mimic the seasons? What would happen if you took to the land and just listened? I keep trying to tell you, the land is trying to teach us. All it wants is for us to listen and be free. Thank you.